Welcome back, uh, everyone. I hope everybody had a wonderful break. Before I introduce the next speaker, I would like to remind everyone that if you want to ask a question, you have to raise your hand, wait for microphone to appear, and then introduce yourself. I also would like to notice that last time we only got questions from ladies and gentlemen on the left. So I would like for those of you to invite those of you who are sitting on the right, I'm not keeping score, to listen to the talk very attentively, formulate your questions, and participate in a richer way that you did before. With that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Hans Clevers, who is a professor at Hubrecht Institute. Hans is an MD, PhD from University of Utrecht, Netherlands. And in the past, he served as a president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Art and Sciences, which means that his science is incredibly good. And I'm looking forward to hearing about his work on introducing of organoids in a study of a human disease. And of course, organoids is a very exciting system that we all can use to characterize our or potential therapeutics better in preclinical uh, uh, models. First of all, congratulations to Fair Journey for, uh, for having this, uh, for building this fantastic building. I briefly went yesterday, it looks beautiful. We're all envious. Um, and also for organizing this, uh, this great symposium. And they were just starting, so we'll probably get many, many great talks. So I'll talk, I will not, we don't make antibodies, so I won't uh, talk about creating antibodies. We, of course, use them like almost all cell biologists. I'll talk about organoids. Uh, what you see here is the, um, the inside of a small intestine. These protrusions are called villi, and these little holes in between are called uh, the crypts of Lieberkuhn. If you've done uh, histology in medical school, you'll, you've probably heard of these. And I'll try to convince you in the beginning of my talk that these multicolored cells are the stem cells of this uh, amazing tissue. And uh, why is it amazing? This is another view of the, uh, the gut epithelium. You see one villus, so food passes by from left to right, long tube. Uh, mice have about a million of these villi, we have a billion. At around the base of the villi are the crypts, there's about eight to 10 per, uh, per villus, per crypt villus unit. And the stem cells sit at the base of the crypt. They divide, uh, as I'll show you, every day, which is very unexpected. Uh, they produce daughter cells. These daughter cells rapidly proliferate for two days, then they exit the crypt. Uh, turn themselves into uh, any of the about 10 different cell types of the gut epithelium, move up while they're now um, uh, exerting their functions, and about three days later they arrive at the tips of the villi and they die. So this entire tissue cell renews every five days. Now the only other cell that I know that has a short lifetime is the, is the neutrophil. I think any other maybe the platelet, which one could not maybe consider a cell. But this is probably the, the fastest cell renewing tissue of the mammalian body, and uh, so that intrigued us a lot. We actually, this was all very old literature. This was known in the 60s, um, and we were trying to hope to find the stem cells at the base of these scripts. Now, we had seen 20 years ago or so that um, um, wind is a major drive, so wind signals are, these are like growth factors, factors. They have been extensively studied during development in many, many different uh, animals like flies and worms and, and mice and frogs. Uh, we found that when we knocked out key components of the wind pathway, identified in my lab, TCF, transcription factors, uh, that actually this process of this very rapid cell renewal in an adult mouse comes to an abrupt halt. So uh, wind was a major driver of these stem cells. We now know that, that wind is a major driver of probably almost all stem cells in the adult body. Uh, and at the same time, we found that activating mutations in the wind pathway, this was done together with Bert Vogelstein, caused colon cancer. So on the one hand, we needed normal wind to keep this process going, this conveyor belt of cells that we knew every five days. And on the other hand, that, uh, that if you mutate the pathway, you get cancer, two sides of the same coin. Pat Brown helped us with microarraying, so we found out what genes were controlled by wind, it's about 200. We went through this entire list uh, that was uh, mostly done by, uh, by Nick Barker, and we found a, uh, one of the genes on that wind target gene list, LGR5, which uniquely was expressed in tiny cells at the base of the crypt. Um, 
here you see them. We actually then constructed mice where they emit a green light and where we could mark the stem cells in blue at will. I won't take you through too much detail. But indeed, when we mark in an adult uh, uh, candidate stem cell, we mark these uh, cells in blue. They produce blue daughter cells. They proliferate for two days. They exit the crypt. They turn themselves into one of the 10 different cell types. Then they continue moving up the flanks of the villi. They're now exposed to the contents of the lumen of the gut, probably the harshest biological environment on our planet. Uh, and they only live for another three days. And indeed, by day five, they arrive at the tips of the villi and they undergo apoptosis, as promised. Now, if we don't kill the mice for analysis after five days, but we wait two years, the ribbons are still there. So the blue cells that create these ribbons are long lived. If we uh, score what cell types are in one ribbon produced from one cell, we see all the cell types, all 10. So these cells are long lived, multipotent, and by our definition, were the stem cells of the gut. Now, there was a lot of resistance because people, you know, it was a dogma that stem cells rarely divide and that they are essentially defined by the fact that they rarely divide. These divide every day, which becomes important. Now, another way of doing this experiment uh, was not turning the stem cells just blue, but we created a so-called confetti allele. This allows us to, um, to create uh, stem cells in four colors. And when you make it homozygous for the geneticist, you have 10 false colors, fluorescent. Uh, and our animator, Jeroen Huybe, uh, proposed that this should be the insides of the gut. And that looked a little bit over the top. And he agreed. But then we got the images. And these are the insides of the mice. And on a blow up, uh, you can see about 10 individual crypts. Eventually, there is about 15 of these stem cells. Eventually, one of them wins the competition that they have. It's a neutral competition, and you end up with one color. And you can see that indeed every crypt has one color, producing cells that in parallel bands. Yeah, I can't point here. But the, so, so there's essentially a number of crypts that flank uh, these villi, and the cells move up like zebra stripes to the tips of the villi. Um, while we were doing experiments, we realized that these phenomena were not only playing out in the gut, but also in many other tissues, including, for instance, the hair follicles. So these mice have beautiful multicolored hairs. And uh, the, the two guys who did this, Hugo Snippert and Lawrence van der Vlier, uh, had a little contact, uh, con uh, contest because Hugo uh, believed that if a mouse would escape and he would flip off the light and then use a black light, that he could actually retrieve the mouse in the animal, animal house. And that, that did work. So they, they are beautiful. They have these multicolored hairs. Uh, well, this, this experiment essentially implied that LGR5, and that's what we now believe, is a marker of probably of all stem cells of epithelia, ectodermal, mesodermal, endodermal, and always these stem cells are driven by wind in their active state. So that, that, that I think is a general rule. Uh, these rules don't work for, um, for the hemopoietic system, for instance, so bone marrow stem cells cannot be expanded outside uh, the body of the donor, uh, even after 40 years of trying, 60 years of trying. Uh, but I'll show you, uh, probably holds for all internal organs. Now, um, I already said that we, uh, we found that against dogma, these stem cells divide every day. And the dogma was there because it was believed that stem cells, when they divide, can cause, can, can sustain DNA damage. You can lose them. Or uh, even worse, they can, turn, can be turned into cancer cells. So it was believed that stem cells very rarely divide, as they do in the bone marrow, and that only their daughter cells would then strongly amplify cell numbers. Now, that is a very logical hypothesis, but it doesn't hold in the, in the gut. We now also know it doesn't hold in the stomach, it doesn't hold in the hair follicles and some other tissues. Uh, so these cells are always proliferating. They go through about 1,000 consecutive cell divisions in the lifetime of a mouse. In humans, they probably go through 20,000 consecutive cell divisions. So it's quite amazing the logistics of what these cells do. We don't know how they do this, but they manage. Um, but based on this observation, uh, Toshi Sato, the Japanese gastroenterologist who is, has his lab back in Tokyo now, um, uh, took up the challenge of seeing if, if we could grow these cells. Now, again, there was another dogma in the stem cell field that normal tissues cannot be grown in the lab. You can keep them alive for, for a brief time, but they cannot be expanded. And everything that grows in the lab is a cancer cell. And if you think about all the cell lines that you're using, they are invariably cancer cells. If you transplant them, they make a tumor or they cause a leukemia. So, um, so many postdocs in the lab didn't want to take this project up, but Toshi did. And uh, we sat down and we, had, we learned quite a bit about the growth factors needed 
to keep the, the, the CRIPS active in a live mouse by just randomly knocking out all sorts of signaling pathways. Um, and and, and we, we thought we probably only need three growth factors. We need to activate wind. Uh, for wind, we, uh, we use a molecule called R-spondin, secreted molecule easily produced, unlike the winds. Later, we found that it actually was the ligand of our LGR5 receptor. LGR5 is a surface and seven transmembrane receptor. EGF, strong mitogen for epithelia, and a BMP inhibitor, noggin. And if we just combine three recombinant proteins, no serum, uh, just standard medium, and then we use matrigel, which is still quite magical. It's a 3D gel, liquid at zero degrees, so easy to handle, and a gel at 37 degrees. We put one stem cell in, uh, you see that here, and then we get these structures growing that uh, are not the intended outcome, because we were hoping to create many stem cells, but rather than just creating a lump of stem cells, like one would do with IPS cells or ES cells, we got structures. And they, uh, if you look carefully, they are mini versions of the gut epithelium. All these buds that you see growing out over a movie that plays about maybe three or four days, um, they are the crypts. So there are multiple stem cells. There are the pennate cells that are usually the neighbors of the stem cells. And every other cell type of the gut is there in the right numbers and in the right location. So really surprising that a stem cell on its own makes a mini version of the gut. Now, by sequencing, we never found that they um, have sustained oncogenic mutations. So we've had them in culture for many years, much longer than you would ever have a mouse uh, live in an animal house. Um, yet, because they grow so vigorously, they grow about tenfold per week. Uh, so in a matter of a month, you have 10,000 fold amplification of tissue, uh, much like cell lines. Um, so we then teamed up with uh, Mamoru Watanabe's lab in Tokyo. Um, and you see the names of his people here. Um, and Toshi in Utrecht sorted one stem cell, and he stresses one stem cell from an RFP positive mouse, so a mouse that is red, and the stem cell is green. Um, and he grew that one stem cell up in Utrecht into about 100 million cells in the form of these mini guts, as he calls them. Uh, we then sent them to Tokyo, and there they were transplanted simply by, uh, by inserting them through the anuses of mice treated with DSS, which is a a chemical that causes inflammatory bowel disease, very popular model uh, for the study of inflammatory bowel disease. And over the next few hours, apparently, the, these Dutch red organoids float around. Uh, they have their basal site on the outside, so the integrins are on the outside. They will not adhere to healthy tissue, but the moment they see collagens or laminins or similar materials, they will adhere with their integrins, open up, and like a living Band-Aid, they uh, seal these lesions. Now, you might notice that this was not the real experiment that is here. So top left, you see uh, um, a black Japanese colon, and these, these orange right patches are the Dutch tissue that actually landed there and uh, inserted itself into the healthy epithelium. And um, you can only find these patches back by confocal uh, microscopy, by looking for RFP, for red fluorescence protein expression. And by any other means, you see a few markers on the right. This tissue is fully normal and, and fully integrated. So one prediction would have been these stem cells are exhausted. That's what hematological stem cell people would say, because we have expanded them dramatically. They probably can no longer divide. That's not the case. They divide happily. Telomeres, I should stress, stay very long in culture. Actually, get longer. Um, and the other prediction would have been, well, somehow with all this excessive stimulation by these growth factors, you have turned these cells into cancer cells. We have never seen any neoplastic uh, event happening. So no adenomas, polyps, or, or no cancers occur in these mice. And based on this, uh, Mamoru has taken this uh, further and currently actually is, is performing his first in man trial, trying to treat uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients with their own organoids. So he samples small bits of normal tissue by colonoscopy, expands it 10,000 fold in culture over a month, and then is aiming to transplant his back into the same patient. So no, <coughs> no transplant issues, there are no HLA uh, problems in this setting. We then realized, this is about 10 years ago, that, that of course this could be used for regenerative medicine, the way Mamoru is doing this, but there, there, are, much, there are many more applications, and I'll give you some in the, some, a lot of short stories in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So applications in cancer are quite obvious because we grow normal tissue for long periods of time, so it should be very easy to grow cancer tissue. And that is, um, that is true, so we meanwhile had learned to do this for human tissue, and you can see here a whole list 
of, uh, of organs that we can turn into, uh, into organoids. Um, I should stress, what we do is we take a so small bit of tissue. tissue. We don't need to sort out stem cells. Many organs actually have no actual stem cells. They have cells that are recruited to be a stem cell when needed. But the, like in the liver, I'll show you that hepatocytes can actually serve as stem cells while they stay hepatocytes. Um, so we take small bits of tissue, small biopsy is good enough. We grind it up, put it in matrix gel, add the right cocktail of growth factors, which is different for every tissue similar but not identical, so we always have to optimize this. It's always active wind, active tyrosine and kinase receptor, uh, and blocking of BMP, TJ, beta. But for instance, for breast tissue, we have to add estrogen. For prostate tissue, we add testosterone, et cetera, et cetera. So that usually takes about half a year or a year to optimize. But if, it, if all is in place, then we can at least grow them ex exponentially for a year while they stay phenotypically and genetically normal and they represent, they essentially have all the cell types of the original tissue. Only epithelial elements grow out. Immune cells disappear, blood vessels disappear, fibroblasts disappear, nerves disappear. So they can be added back, but then you have to get them from, if it's, if it's an immune system, from the same individual, which is a bit of a challenge. Uh, but if you think about all of these organs, the essential functions of internal organs are invariably uh, uh, taken care of by the epithelial part of that organ. Uh, so essentially we grow the functional parts of the organs, we lose all the rest. Um, and for cancer, for instance, carcinomas by definition are epithelial. All carcinomas are epithelial, so we can always grow them. And they account for about 90% of all cancers uh, in, in adult uh, patients. Now we can, we can use these organoids to model cancer and hereditary and infectious disease. And cancer, um, here we, but now many other labs have done very similar things. So essentially one can build biobanks of cancer patients. And uh, in Utrecht for colon cancer that you see here, we probably have about four or 500 lines now in the freezer that are fully sequenced that you can grow forever. They grow with different speeds, I should stress. And for some of them, we also have healthy tissue if we can, uh, so we can actually compare side by side healthy tissue and the cancer tissue. Now, um, you can sequence, you get beautiful sequences because the tumors are only contain cancer cells, everything else is gone. Also, of course, a disadvantage in certain models. Uh, but the, most importantly, we have the live cancer cells and we can now expose them in the lab to a, a number of drugs and, and a foundation in Utrecht that we've set up together actually with Ton Lochtenberg, who speaks next, um, has, been, uh, has been able to do 30,000 compound screens still in a fairly crude version of this assay. And now a number of companies that are trying to robotize this to make this much faster and uh, to make it more useful for, for drug development or for personalized medicine. And uh, so this is what they look like on the left, uh, uh, healthy on the right, a tumor from the same patient. Um, and when you sequence, you can confirm actually that they have the same mutations as you'd see in the, in the primary tumor and they don't add more mutations in or homogenic mutations in culture. Um, you can drug screen, indeed this was all done by hand, not on robots or anything, uh, works well. It's extremely robust as an assay. Uh, of course, it's very important that what you measure in vitro uh, reflects what happens in vivo with the patient. Uh, while we were trying to, to, to do these observational trials, a beautiful paper came out from a consortium in the UK that shows that uh, in at least four or five small phase one, two trials, where they, at the same time that the trial started, they uh, isolated tissue for organoids, that the predicted value, at least for the drugs in those trials, all experimental drugs, was over 85%, both in terms of, of sensitivity and resistance. So extremely high, you have to realize that that when a patient, uh, so first line treatment for the average cancer patient probably is effective for 40% of patients and 60% of patients, you know, they get the drug, they, they get all the side effects, they lose time and maybe the second line will work, maybe it won't work, but the situation is already much worse than it would have been. Um, <clears throat> so this would be comparable to testing uh, uh, antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So when you have a, you know, a pneumonia with a bacterium in your lungs, uh, the bacteria get cultured. In the lab, it's determined what is the best antibiotic for the individual patient. And then after, in my medical school days, it was three days, it's probably now faster by PCR, but you're then given a drug that will surely kill your bacteria. Now for cancer, you're classified, and then it's a statistical argument why you're given a drug. You don't, you're in a group that will respond. 
but you don't know whether you are in the responders or the non-responders. You only find out when you get the drug. But this would offer the, uh, the potential to actually determine whether your cancer cells do get killed by the drug that, that, that is uh, designed for your group. And maybe you can shift. Well, we then there are, there are now numerous papers that, that report similar observations. In 2019, there were several studies where, where we were involved. We're not the lead authors on these papers that all come up with a similar predictive value of 80 to 90 percent. Um, I should stress, though, that this is a tedious experiment. It takes five, six weeks, sometimes longer, to be able to read out. That's too slow to be meaningful in the clinic. Um, also, you need skilled personnel, uh, the logistics of getting life. As you know, pathologists like to look at tissues, but they, the first thing they do, they put an informal in. That's good for looking under the microscope, but it's too late to grow them as organoids. That has been a major challenge to set up the, the logistical pipeline to get living tissue uh, in the lab to culture. That, I think, we have worked out. Uh, and there are now a, a number of companies that are built, as I said, robots that will, um, that will allow this to do this in about a week, so that you don't have to expand the cells. All is done at a very small scale, um, and you can do, you can think of uh, now of, uh, <coughs> of systems where you could do uh, really high throughput screens of 100,000 or even a million compounds, given the robots that are currently being developed. Um, Another way of doing cancer research is using is combining this with CRISPR, and this is this is two studies: uh, one from uh, from my lab, Jarno Drost, the other from Toshi, who at that time was already uh, independent in Tokyo uh, about five six years ago. So we both realized that the growth factors that we empirically had found to be required to expand these stem cells and to be necessary in a crypt, that the cancer of the, of the in this case the colon. Um, activates or blocks exactly the same pathways as we am activate or block with our growth factors. And that's here. So the most common mutation in colon cancer is, is uh, the loss of APC, one of the first uh, tumor suppressors ever cloned. 80 to 90 percent of colon cancer cases lose APC. This activates the wind pathway. Uh, we add wind to the medium. So the, the, the prediction would be if we take a normal organoid and we take wind out of the medium, they will die. But if we mutate APC at the same time, they will live and they no longer require wind. Now, the same thing holds for KRAS and EGF. Uh, the same thing holds for SMAD4 and Noggin. Noggin is our BMP inhibitor. SMAD4 is a transcription factor in the BMP TGF data pathway. So if you knock it out, you would no longer need this. And so we both set out using CRISPR to try to, uh, to recapitulate what Bert Vogelstein and, and, and Eric Fearon in, in, I think, 1990 already proposed, that there is a relatively ordered succession of, of mutations that take a normal colon stem cell, presumably, uh, finally to become a, a full-blown invasive colon cancer cell. And, uh, yeah, there's a little movie that illustrates this again. So here you see the normal colon epithelium. Um, Colon cancer probably takes 20 years to develop, so an early adenoma, intermediate adenoma, late adenoma, all driven by additional mutations, and finally an invasive and metastasizing carcinoma. And that's what we try to engineer. So we start from a normal colon organoid. Uh, we grow it up. Uh, you see the growth factors on the right. We knock out APC with CRISPR, um, leave wind out of the medium, everything dies, and only the APC mutants will grow out. That's what we observe. Now, next step is... Um, I believe P53. Yeah, so you see that here. So here we can kill the, uh, the wild types with a small molecule called Nutlin, and everything dies. But now we have the double mutants, uh, APC P53. They still need the growth factors on the right. We now target KRAS. Here we have to do a knock-in. Works quite easily in organoids. So we activate KRAS, leave EGF out. Now they have three mutations, and they, know, and they only need knock-in. And the last one, you see here, uh, we target um, SMAD4, transcription factor in the BMP pathway. If we knock that out, we block the BMP pathway. We leave the blocker out of the medium, and they happily grow. So now we have, it took about three months. We now have a whole series of, of colon organoids with one, two, three, or four mutations in all combinations. We can now actually do this in one shot for six, up to six genes, and then we get a library of using base editors, I won't talk about it here, but CRISPR base editors are really incredible reagents. 
uh, you can change single bases uh, anywhere in the genome of these, uh, of these uh, cells. And you can, in one shot, we can hit six genes, and then you get a library of organoids where every organoid will have a different combination. Some have all six, some have five, some have a heterozygous. And in one shot, you make a, a large library in the same genetic background. So if you want to study if a drug works or doesn't work, this is probably the best way and to see how that correlates uh, to mutations. Uh, when we transplant these into immunodeficient mice, on the top right, you see the four mutation version that actually is now a full-blown carcinoma. It, it invades, as you can see, and it metastasizes to the liver. So this essentially confirms what was known. You need four mutations in these four pathways to take a normal cell into a full-blown colon cancer cell. Liver, I'll give you just a few uh, images. So the liver uh, has two main liver cell types, cholangiocytes, which build the bile ducts, and hepatocytes, which are the chemical factories and, uh, and the producers of many of the serum proteins. All other cells in the liver come from elsewhere, like kupfer cells come from the bone marrow, stellate cells, essentially fibroblasts, blood vessels come from outside. There's, there's two real liver cell types. Now, the liver is the most regenerative organ after damage of our body. Um, you can either chronically uh, damage the liver by uh, toxins or by viruses, uh, then the cholangiocytes become oval cells, and they, they're really like stem cells briefly, and they can make both cell types, so hepatocytic the cholangiocytes. And the other way, uh, so, so for, uh, first I'll show this. So here we, from donor livers, we sort, uh, at the bottom, we sort cholangiocytes, a few percent of the cells in the liver on the top, hepatocytes. Hepatocytes are key in drug development for many, many different reasons, but nobody could ever produce them. Uh, uh, you actually get them from a donor liver uh, and human hepatocytes. Uh, the cell lines, our cancer cell lines, they really are not hepatocytes. And also IPS-based hepatocytes, they have some resemblance to real hepatocytes, but they're, they're not there yet. Cholangiocytes were very easy to grow. Um, as you can see on the right, very surprisingly, these are full-blown differentiated cells that transport bile, uh, uh, take bile up and transport it to the, the, the gallbladder and then into the duodenum. Uh, very not very beautiful cells. One to one, you can take a fully differentiated hepatocyte, uh, cholangiocyte, put it in the growth factor cocktail. It'll de-differentiate in two or three days, and then uh, and then be pi potent and, and make both cell types. Um, Mary Hu, uh, who the first author on this paper, uh, has gone on with this in her own lab and shown that the, the, what the actually happens at the genomic level. So you get a rapid demethylation, et cetera, et cetera, of the DNA. You really see an in vivo physiological reprogramming of fully differentiated cells to temporarily become a stem cell. Now, it turns out that this happens in many, many other organs and is totally different from the dogmas from the uh, hemopoietic field. Anyway, so these grow and they... Uh, uh, here you see a confocal, so there are these hollow cysts. Uh, if you put them together, they make a tube, so they really make a bile duct, and uh, they're fully differentiated. Um, but the, the hepatocyte is essentially the most important cell here, and that could never be cultured. Now, we tried lots of things, and then who, really, who came up with a cocktail of about 12 different growth factors and small molecules? Uh, first in mouse, and this is a mouse where the, uh, the albumin gene is marked in red, as you can see here. And uh, so, so, so uh, starting from a single hepatocyte, we can grow organoids. They look very different. They almost have no lumen. Most others have a lumen and have highly polarized cells. Then we learned how to do this for humans. Again, Hui Li Hu did this, who now has a lab in China. Here you see the production of alpha-1 antitrypsin. So these are large cells, 40 micrometers, large nuclei. If you ever look at liver, big nucleoli, and you, you can see the amount of this serum protein is, is extremely high. The same for albumin. We get the same levels as a, as a newly uh, isolated, uh, freshly isolated hepatocyte. You see a bond mitosis on the right. So they divide. They don't grow very fast, maybe two to threefold per week. Uh, but they grow forever, particularly if the donor is very young or if it's a fetal liver. Uh, I think I have a few other images. Yeah, here. They even do more. Um, yeah, it's probably better to see in the next slide. Yeah, so what you see here is these large hepatocytes. Essentially, they, uh, when you do single cell sequencing, they are hepatocytes, but some of them divide uh, while being an hepatocyte. So they are stem cells and hepatocytes at the same time. Um, but they also create these, you might see these little ducts, and these are the bile canaliculi. So um, the bile duct takes the bile out of the liver, but the hepatocytes produce the bile acids. And they secrete it uh, to the apical lumen, and the, the, the apical sides of two 
hepatocytes merge together to form a channel. And that's what you see here. So you see these little, we stain this for MRP2, which is the bile transporter. So this is um, uh, indeed a fully functional hepatocyte. It's producing bile acids. It secretes this into the bile canaliculus that it creates itself with its neighbor. Then the bile ends up in this big yellow blob, which is probably where the bile duct should have been. And because there are no cholangiocytes in these organoids, that's where they accumulate and eventually they burst open and they release the, the bile acid. But this shows how complete these, these organoids are and how, I think I should stress, how self-organizing -organiz they are. We, we don't do much. We just add a few growth factors, then we let them do their biology and they recreate, like stem cells in vivo would do, they recreate uh, the normal tissue. These can also be transplanted. This is in a... Uh, popular transplant model, FAH deficient mice. Uh, in blue, you see the mouse liver where the on normal diet, the, the hepatocytes slowly die. Um, but when you transplant these hepatocytes, um, the human hepatocytes, <coughs> they, will, they will create these growing islands. And you might appreciate these little yellow dots. They are KI67 positive cells, so they are dividing two months after transplantation. So these islands keep on growing till they fill up the entire liver of these mice and you can see milligrams uh, of human albumin in the serum of this mice. They, they really are, are functional. This was done in collaboration with Ipe Um I have a few more stories. This is a paper that came out uh, last year. And essentially, uh, I didn't know this project was happening in my lab. It's my two PhD students, Cayetano and Jens, together with Axel, PhD student in Ruben van Boxel's lab nearby. Um, they had read about a a version of E. coli, a strain of E. coli that is quite common. There was a long history of publications on this strain, which has about 60 extra kilobases in its single chromosome. You see it here on the top right, and those 60 kilobases uh, hold about 10 genes that together constitute a synthesis pathway for a polyketide. Poly PKS is polyketide synthesis. And there's actually many of these PKS islets in, in the bacterial uh, world. Uh, and these were important, people thought, because if you take E. coli, first of all, they occur in humans. Uh, probably about 20 or 30 people in the audience have this particular E. coli in their colon. And you'll learn that it's not a good idea to have them there. Because um, if you take them out and you culture them and you put them on the human cell line, almost immediately you see, you see double strand breaks. So, um, so the, the, the product of this locus, it's called colibactin, it's a small molecule, I'll show it later, um, will enter human cells, so secreted from the coli, enters human cells, causes double-strand breaks in the DNA. Now, this is not what you want to have, particularly not in stem cells. So um, all, also, somewhat surprisingly, um, there is one strain called Nissel that is a very popular probiotic that has this pathogenicity island. So it's a genotoxic bacterium, it was already known, I uh, will show exactly what it do, do in the next slide. But it's taken by, or it's, it's prescribed by gastroenterologists. There were many trials ongoing when we started doing these experiments around the world in serious university hospitals for inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel disease, psoriasis, and other chronic diseases that are often dif difficult to treat. So they asked uh, my th the three PhD students, uh, is this colibactin? Is it not simply causing double strand breaks, but does the resolution of those breaks, does it result in mutations? So can it, this be a car not only a mutagen, but can it be carcinogen? And um, here you see that, so while we're doing this, this paper came out, beautiful paper in science on the chemistry of colibactin. It's extremely labile, so, so they, I don't think any lab has ever synthesized the entire molecule, but this is the deduced structure. Um, and you see uh, these two AD, AD on the two sides. The warheads, the two warheads, the left and the right side of this molecule in this paper are proposed to covalently bind to A residues in DNA. And if this happens between two strands, this is an interstrand crosslink. This is not compatible with life for that cell. So that cell then has to somehow get rid of the adduct. And in doing so, it apparently causes a double strand break. That was, that was known. Um, this is the, here is the, the, our experiment. So we, uh, we got from, from collaborators in France, we got the strain and also a mutant version of the same strain. So it's a very nicely controlled experiment on the right. So the left one is the bad one. The right one is the negative control. It cannot make colibactin. And the idea would be is that we, um, first of all, learn how to grow these in the lab. That, that turns out to be as easy as any other E. coli, uh, many other gram-negative anaerobics are very difficult to culture. Anyway, so we can grow them on agar plates. We inject them 
first experiment into a normal human clonal organoid. So every cell in these organoids have exactly the same genome. They were recently cloned. You now expose them um, over a few days to the bad bacterium on the left and the good one on the right. And then we simply look, do we see the double strand breaks? So that can be confirmed what's in the literature. Now, the, the, you see in the middle, PKS plus. Uh, in blue, every dot is, a, is an organoid that was injected by hand by the PhD student, quite an experiment. And the uh, red dots in this magnification are individual double strand breaks that are, that are stained by gamma H2AX. And you can see there's many, many breaks. And on the right, the negative control in the entire culture, they saw one break. So, so we could confirm in organoids what was known for experiments done on HeLa cells or other human uh, cancer cells. So then they did the heroic experiments. So now they just not injected once, but injected over three to five months in several experiments. The problem is if bacteria escape from the organoid, they will overgrow the culture. They don't need the cells. So they, they had to cure the organoids every Friday and then inject again on Monday. Uh, did this for, uh, with antibiotics, so they did this for about three to five months. And then after three to five months, we could now sequence um, the ones on the left, left whole genome and the ones on the right. And uh, the hope, you know, the, the expected uh, outcome would be that the ones on the left have more mutations and maybe they have recognizable mutations because there is a very specific mutational process. Now, if we would just sequence the one on the left, we would not see anything because every cell might have many mutations, but it'll always differ from its neighbor. So everything gets diluted out. So they then subcloned single cells from these organoids, grew them up, uh, just to amplify the genomes of single cells. It's like a PCR for the whole genome. And then they sequenced uh, subclonal organoids. Uh, so you see the DNA here, whole genome sequence on these clones. And on the left, uh, you see the bad one. On the, on the right, you see the control. We can just ask, okay, where are the point mutations in this case? And it turns out that, if, of course, in culture, you will always see somatic mutations with a certain rate. But the ones on the left had, first of all, many more mutations, and also they had a unique type of mutations. And, and I will take you through all the bioinformatics, but it turns out that we see a very specific, easily recognizable motif that gets mutated. A TA pair in the middle at position zero is either changing into any other base pair or it's deleted. So just you lose. So in the second case, you have a frame shift if it's in a gene. In the first case, you'll have a missense mis -sense mutation or a stop codon. And this happens in, a, in the context of an A at minus three. If you now go back to the uh, to the model on the uh, top left. Uh, indeed, this looks like what like the proposed mechanism for colibactin binds covalently to an A minus three, covalently to an A at position zero opposite the T. Now the cell wants to repair this, and in doing so, it takes out the, the, the base pair at position zero, or it changes it into another base. And uh, so this is very easily found because no other mechanism causes these types of mutations. Uh, of course, also, this was very artificial, but then we could ask, do we see this back in, uh, in large cohorts of cancer patients? First, we worked at the Hartwig, where they have uh, sequenced almost 4,000 uh, metastases of a large variety of different cancers. And you might see this, but you see the sort of the dots that go up uh, on the left of this uh, graph are the colon cancers. So about 10%, we now know about 15% of colon cancers show this particular type of mutation. So the, T, the A at minus three, and then the TA at zero changed or deleted. Uh, no other cancers do this. The occasional bladder cancer has it, but E. coli can chronically live in the bladder, and the occasional head and neck cancer has it. But like breast cancers, which are sterile, never show these types of mutations. And then the second cohort from Genomics England was only colon cancers, but we again saw this mutational signature in about 10 to 15% of the patients, and mostly in the left-sided uh, colon cancers. So this is associative evidence, but we believe that indeed the, the, in the history of, these, of some colon cancer patients, this bacterium has been present, has caused mutations. And what I then show you here, some of these single base changes actually hit cancer genes, and very often APC mutations seem to be caused by this particular mechanism. And therefore, one would conclude that these bacteria are indeed uh, mutagenic, and they, the mutations they make are very easily recognizable. Um, you see them in a subset of cancer patients. Um, you might now think about removing this strain 
uh, from the human population. They're very easily found. And like the, the only other bacterium that's linked to cancer is Helicobacter, or causatively linked to cancer, Helicobacter for stomach cancer. There, the removal of the bacterium works very well. Um, so, so there are now a number of cohorts around the world are being followed. The, the, it's being determined who carries these bacteria. Are there only kids? Are they within families? Are there certain ethnic groups that have more of these bacteria? And uh, people think of ways of removing uh, these bacteria now. And I think a strong recommendation is don't prescribe these EKS positive E. coli to people that already have inflammatory bowel disease and have a high chance of, of undergoing cancer. Um, then rapidly, two, uh, um, two examples of using organoids for infectious disease. The first one, uh, actually, when we went into lockdown early last year, I should say, actually, I was allowed to take my mask off if you're worried, and I'm vaccinated, so that should be, should be okay. So we realized that um, ACE2, that was already immediately known that ACE2 was the receptor for the virus. Um, the same receptor was, was already known for the original SARS virus. Uh, ACE2 is most highly expressed on gut epithelium. We knew that. And there was also an indication that uh, uh, quite a number of patients don't initially represent with uh, respiratory uh, symptoms. They, repre they pre present with uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, sometimes only gastrointestinal symptoms, so nausea, um, diarrhea, stomach aches. Um, and there were some uh, scattered reports that one could detect by PCR viral RNA in stool, indicating that, that, that this might be a second organ that's infected, uh, maybe clinically not too relevant because you will not die of, of this if you end up in the ICU is because of your respiratory problems, but it might be an important route of, uh, of transmission of the virus. So uh, we teamed up with the lab in Rotterdam that we already had, had been working on coronavirus for a long time, done a lot of work on SARS and, and MERS and also on SARS-CoV-2, so Mark Lamers and Bart Haagmans in my lab. My names are not there, it was Joep, uh, Joep Beumer and Jelte van der Vaart. Um, and we could show indeed uh, human small intestinal or colon organoids when given a little bit of the virus, they would amplify the virus dramatically, actually much better than airway organoids. Um, and uh, you can see this in the order of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 fold application in a matter of uh, less than three days. And we do this both for live virus and for viral RNA. So this is, these are really infectious particles that are being produced. Here you see after 24 hours in white, um, one cell that's, that is infected in a human intestinal organoid. Uh, we stain in white for the nuclear protein of the virus. And then you can see a little bit later, two, two days later, essentially the entire organoid is now positive for the virus. So they really infect and then propagate in culture. The cells actually do well. We do all sorts of analyses, single cell sequencing, but they don't, they don't get killed right away. Uh, other viruses do this. So that's probably a reason why uh, it already, these patients are already infectious before they ever note that they are sick. So they already produce a lot of virus uh, while there's very little pathogenic effects in the tissue yet. Um, so this was published. Uh, we then, this actually paper just also got accepted. Um, we then uh, asked, can we now use this model to find out what genes, what human genes are used by this virus to, for the infectious cycle? And of course, ACE2, the receptor, was a clear one, uh, but there was a whole list published, you know, three cell papers with genome-wide screens, CRISPR screens, that had 50 genes that were key. Um, so we first uh, looked if we could actually uh, use this system. Now with base editors, we very r rapidly can knock out any gene cause just inducing stop codons. And what you see uh, top left graph is SARS-CoV-2 needs ACE2, and in blue, the blue lines, if we knock out the receptor, they're no longer infected, so it works. SARS-CoV, uh, bottom right of the three graphs, uh, also is blocked if the receptor is no longer there. But MERS, you might have heard of this Arab version of corona but that, that still constantly jumps from camels to humans. Uh, as far as I know, no report yet that it jumps, jumps from humans to humans, but it's highly lethal. But 50% of the people, people who get infected will die. Um, it was also known that it has another receptor, and this one still infects, so it's a, a negative control. And the other receptor is DPP4, so if you knock that out, SARS-CoV-2 happily infects. SARS, I don't show it, also happily infects. But now MERS can no longer infect these organoids. So that's the positive control here. Uh, we then went through a, a large number of, of likely uh, human genes, and you see a number of them here. Um, I just showed that Tempris 2 are the blue lines, the bottom four, these are all four different clones, 
appear to be essential. Now, TAMPRS2 is, is known to be a protease on the surface of cells, on the outside of cells, that will cleave the spike protein and then allow the virus to enter the cell. So that was another known and, and fully established target gene, but none of the other genes when we knock it out have any effect in this system. Uh, and most importantly, um, cathepsin L, CTSL, uh, is, a, is a protease key in the endocytic pathway, um, key in vero cells for infection. So vero cells are African green monkey cells that are used by almost all virology labs. Um, they're more fibroblast-like, they're not really epithelial-like. Uh, when we knock uh, cathepsin L out, uh, we don't block the virus, as what would happen in vero cells. We essentially enhance the entry of the virus, as you can see the, blue, the purple lines on top. So uh, we also then noted that uh, chloroquine, which in our hands also is a great, or hydroxychloroquine, a great blocker of infection. As you know, you know several presidents of entire countries were very happy about this, uh, this drug. And I know that many of the hospitals in Holland actually prescribed chloroquine in the beginning of the, of the pandemic because there was nothing else and there was some convincing evidence. So it does block entry into vera cells fantastically well. We now know it does nothing in patients, actually only harms the patients, and it does nothing in organoids. And the big difference here is that organoids are primary epithelial cells and uh, vero cells are fibroblasts. Now, what, is the, what does the virus encounter when it enters a patient's airway or intestinal tract? It, 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 it encounters polarized epithelial cells. Um, on the left, you see here how the virus enters in vero cells, so it's by endothytosis. This is sensitive to chloroquine. It's sensitive to, it's dependent on, on cathepsin. Uh, on the right, you see what happens in a primary epithelial cell. Uh, the same receptor, ACE2, is involved, but on the primary epithelial cell, TAMPRS2 will now cleave uh, the spike, activate spike, and the virus directly fuses with the membrane and injects its RNA into the cell. So there's no endocytosis, there's no role for the cathepsins, and also there's no effect of chloroquine. So here, uh, one conclusion would be that actually uh, next time, the next pandemic, maybe do the screens on vero cells, but then as an intermediate step, try on primary epithelial cells because they, they are closer they're not a patient, but they're closer to a patient than these, than these green monkey cells. And then finally, just because the movie is very nice, uh, Cryptosporidium is a, is a malaria-related parasite. You might remember that it's a eukaryotic, malaria is a eukaryotic parasite that goes through a mosquito and the human host and actually cycles through uh, asexual and sexual stages, very complicated life cycle. Cryptosporidium does the same, but it only has one host, so it doesn't need insects for its transmission. Um, you see it here, but I'll, this is here in the movie. So here, and cryptosporidium is a big problem in veterinary sciences, but also in, uh, in third world countries, uh, chronic intestinal disease, um, no good drugs. And what we'd hope to do is to replicate the cell cycle, the life cycle in organoids. It, it could never be grown in the lab. So it starts with oocysts. So these are, you see them here. Uh, typically cows will pick it up from grass, from infected cattle. Uh, these oocysts, here we inject into an organoid, that's the idea of the experiment. So the oocysts will land on the epithelium. We find that they actually, the, the little critters that come out, the uh, sporozoites, there's four of them per oocyst, that they actually infect fully differentiated enterocytes. So these are the, the cells on the villus that you never see in cell lines, you only see in organoids. They make type 1 merons, so one, once they enter a cell, these type 1 merons release their contents. I think there's about eight again of these type 1 merozoites. It's an amplification step. They do this once again. So they will again infect a fully differentiated enterocyte. Again, this cannot be done in cell lines, uh, but works well in organoids, as I'll show you. Uh, we get a type 2 meron, again with a defined number of nuclei, so that's how we can identify them. Uh, the type 2 merons come out. Now we enter the sexual cycle. We're about two and a half days into the experiment. Now we make two types of structures. In front, it's the uh, male version uh, that makes microgamons. In the back, it's the female version that, that has one macrogamont. And here you see a microgamete coming out uh, and fertilizing the and forming a zygote. And then this will now, this structure will now uh, become an oocyst and be, be released from the epithelium and then leaves the body with the stool and is then eaten up by uh, another cow or by uh, occasionally by humans and causing a chronic infection. Now this works well in these organoids just by EM. 
uh, we see all the stages and after they, 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 they produce very high numbers of oocysts and when we take these oocysts, they will infect mice. So they're really infectious particles. Um, Matthias Luthoff, um, then at APFL, has actually used this for a chronic infection model where he created from, from the mini guts, he created a tube that he could, could maintain for months in a gel while, while basically has have fluid f flowing through the tube. When he infects these tubes, there's a nature paper very recently from his lab uh, with the O-cysts. Uh, you can see that they chronically infect these tubes. So this is a very nice model for chronic infection by a parasite that could never be studied in the lab uh, or outside uh, experimental animals. And with that, uh, I reached the end of my seminar, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I think I left some time for Q&A. Thank you. Wow, I would just say, wow, the advances that you describe are utterly amazing and opportunities they open for us to study anti-cancer treatment, anti-parasitics. While the audience is collecting their thoughts, I would like you to ask a question about the importance of scaffold. There is a long-standing debate in hepatology and fibrostenotic IBD whether you can take a highly cirrhotic liver, repopulate it with normally behaving cells, and reverse the disease. Your results seem to argue that these cells form normal structures in very artificial environments. So how do you feel about an opportunity to use hepatic cell transplants in a situation of cirrhotic level or fibrostenotic IBD with an attempt to reverse the disease? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we've, of course, been thinking a lot about this. I think when you do this very late, so when the, the liver is really scarred and cirrhotic, it will be very, very difficult to, to recreate a, uh, a functional liver. Uh, so where you really need a, a, a liver transplant that's currently being done. Also, that is al always very done very late in the disease process. Um, there are some indications, not from our lab, that actually if the, the fibrotic process is already starting, you then put healthy normal cells in. Uh, they will reverse that to some extent. So if this ever becomes a therapy, it has to be earlier than where we now transplant uh, cancer patients. There would be much less of a logistical problem because you can actually, you can freeze these cells easily. So you can right. have a bank like a blood bank. You could have a bank of liver organoids and then just thaw the one out electively when, the, when you want to transplant the patient. There is actually uh, currently, I don't think I mentioned it, a trial has started for a different disease. Um, dry mouth after head and neck cancer and radiation where the parotid gland and the uh, submandibular glands yep. uh, basically get destroyed by radiation. Terrible disease, your teeth fall out, you know, extremely painful, difficult to eat, difficult to talk. Um, the, 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 the animal experiments, so human salivary gland organoids in destroyed uh, mouse, radiated destroyed mouse, they, re they restore the function of these glands. And as we speak, a trial has started in Groningen in Holland where they are now using these cultured protein glands. I believe autologous cells, so they basically take the few cells that are still alive, expand them, and they inject them through the skin into the salivary glands. And uh, they hope to see the same thing as they've seen with human salivary gland organoids in irradiated mice. So that would, that would say that for that particular organ, it looks like it can re repair even pretty bad changes to an organ. Yeah. But this is all very early days. Thank you, Hans. Rene, uh, can we have a microphone on the right, row three? First, thanks for a beautiful talk and beautiful signs and, uh, and a very nice movies. Uh, I'm uh, Rene Hood uh, from Montes Bioscience in Leuven, a small biotech. And, and sort of, um, I mean, intrigued by these organoids, how far you can go. Um, for example, um, can you mimic the tumor microenvironment? Can you in introduce T cells, macrophages? And we're particularly interested, for example, in endothelial cells. And have you looked in that? First question is, have you looked into this? And secondly, do you think it's possible in the future to really make organoids which mimicking really, you know, the whole tumor microenvironment? Yeah, so, so my first answer is that my lab actually always has gone for the, uh, for the simplest version uh, of, of the model system uh, and, and first study that and then slowly build it up. 
which is one way of, of tackling these problems. So we have been involved in a few studies where indeed immune cells you know, and, and uh, checkpoint inhibitors have been shown to, uh, to score very well in these organoids. And you can do it in a patient-specific fashion. Uh, other labs have done a lot more. So there is indeed there's, there's a big activity now of adding uh, tumor associated fibroblasts, tumor associated macrophages, T cells, other immune cells. To organoids in a often in a personalized fashion, so you can you can you have to take the T cells from the same patient that from which you grow the uh, the organoids. So that works. I mean, it, papers are the oldest papers are a year and a half, two years old. So this is a rapidly developing field. I think it will be important because you can actually rebuild the human situation rather than do this in mice. Um, the blood vessels has been done a lot by companies. So the organ on chip companies who used to use cell lines. Uh, cancer cell lines now are switching to organoids. And, uh, and I think if you want to have blood vessels in a structured way grow in, you need this, the scaffold, you need the, the chip environment where you, where you have separate uh, compartments, one holding the cancer, another holding the endothelial cells, and then they actually beautifully create. We've worked a little bit with uh, Mimetas in Leiden. They have beautiful images where you can actually then recreate blood vessels going into these, uh, these tumors. And, and they've shown that you can now add immune cells and actually use the blood vessels and then exit and enter the tumor. So I think this can all be built, but it's, of course, this is going to be a lot of work to, to create something that really resembles a human tumor. Thanks a lot. There is a question in the fourth row on the right. Um, thank you, Hans, for a great talk. I'm Valerie van Horen from Ona Therapeutics, a small biotech in Barcelona. And uh, I had a very similar question because I'm also thinking how could we use these organoids for uh, screening and understanding better our drugs. So apart from immune cells, could you somehow adapt your organoids to screen metastasis? So um, I think, what is the readout? So you have this organoids, you screen libraries to see, I guess you check for cell survival or proliferation. Can you check somehow if they have become less or more metastatic? Because I guess these organoids don't have a metastatic phenotype. Or if you would translate them again in mice, uh, yeah. transplant them in mice, would you see then some metastatic readout? Is that possible? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's two answers here. First of all, there, there are now we, but many other labs have actually have sets of organoids where you have the primary tumor and a set of metastases from the same patient growing as organoids. Um, I should say that, that that also found by DNA sequencing by a number of labs, the difference between the metastasis and the tumor, in the original primary tumor, are not very large, if they exist at all. Um, yeah, so we haven't really done anything to study metastatic behavior, but um, I know other labs have looked at motility, for instance, see if individual epithelial cells will leave the tumors. Uh, you might have noticed in some of the movies that I showed of the, that actually we see when we have enough mutations, cancer mutations in a primary, in a normal organoid. So if you, if you make the cancers not from a cancer, but starting from a normal organoid, they slowly become, they lose epithelial context to become more invasive. And that would probably be a first stage towards metastasis. But I'm not aware of an assay that visualizes the metastatic process um, with organoids. But again, so you can have organoids from metastases. They actually, they're typically when an, in an advanced cancer patient, um, that is what we obtain as tissue and can grow. And for instance, for ovarian cancer, we often get both the primary tumor and all the metastases in the abdominal space because they remove them in a single surgical setting. Um, hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you. We have time for one more question. Tanya, front row on the left. Now? Oh, yeah. fantastic. So Tanya Nwabrancova, um, and again, I think that everyone is fascinated by the talk. Thank you so much. But the question is, so you, you told us that organoids from pure um, sort of original cell type for the organ can form fascinating structures, right? And they are self-organizing, right? And you showed bile ducts that accumulate bile, et cetera. So my question is, do you actually see any differences in those structures compared to the actual organ? For example, there was beautiful work by Matthias Nerendorf a couple years ago saying that macrophages in the heart 
actually I needed to coordinate the beating of cardiomyocytes in the organ, right? So, so did you see any of the missing pieces, right, despite the obvious absence of other cells no. that are not formed by that original cell type of the organ and that are needing the presence of other cell no. types? Yeah. Yeah, so I should maybe say that we, we think we see the, the basic characteristics of an organ, of a tissue, but uh, there's lots of, of, of modifications of those basic characteristics, which are often done by stroma, or like in the, in the lung or in the heart. It's also muscle activity itself, so the stretching of the tissue will structure it. Of course, that can all be, again, mimicked uh, with organs on chips but it's not present in the, uh, the primary organ. So, so yeah, they are, they are abstractions of the real organ, but they tend to harbor the essential functions in an, in an experimentally uh, tr attractive way. Um, the moment we add other cell types, we see things changing. We see that there's some change, change morphology, so some functions now are controlled, whereas they normally are not, are just on or off and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, again, you can, you, can, you can create this complexity in a stepwise fashion in a very controlled fashion. Yeah, but it's relevant. It's very relevant what you say. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor Clevers again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.